So let's talk about this growth rate. My notes had a little problem here. I used to do this class over more than, more, more than one semester, so some of these notes I struck out. But um, what happens if the growth rate uh, is not constant, if it changes over time? We'll look into how to do that with what I call the H model. Um, but if you think the stock's earnings growth is going to be 3%, and someone else thinks it's 4%, with 3%, I got a value of $160. 4%, I got a value of $200. It's a big difference in those two values, 25% difference. Not a huge change in the assumption. And there's so much more we could change. Our discount rate could be very different. Our risk-free rate, our market risk premium, our beta, all those things are possible to be different. And every one of them will have a huge impact on valuation. Um, so stock valuations are very sensitive to assumptions. Remember I said with Walmart that that valuation, over a third of it was more than 50 years out. If someone were to guess that Walmart's growth rate over the next 300 years was going to be 3% and it actually came out at 4%, I would say, well, that's, that was a decent forecast, but uh, you would have gotten, you would have made a big mistake. And as far as buying or not buying Walmart stock today. Um, so you think it's worth 160, someone else thinks it's worth 200, the current price is 180. You sell because you think it's worth 160, they buy because they think it's 200. So both of you are happy, but not both of you will be right. The thing is, one of these two values might be wrong, or right? Or one, they may both be wrong. It's not like you're going to fin figure this out in the next year or two. You're talking over the next 50, 100 years. So you don't know. You'll, you'll be long, long gone before we figure out whether you were right or they were right. Um, so, um, yeah, I want to skip this pair. If you can read through it, it's pretty much what I've been saying. So it's real important in stock valuation that your growth rates. Um, probably the most important assumption you make. The beta is pretty important as well. Um, but what I what I like to do, and that's why we're going to do a data table, is I like to think of a range of values. Remember, intrinsic value is what you think something's worth. So I, I like to have a range, a reasonable range for what I think this stock might be worth. Um, and I'll show you with Walmart how I'll do that. And then when we do the, the uh, Excel application number 11, I'll do the first problem and show you how to set that up as well. So I actually did the data table twice. <clears throat> um, so the models, we're not going to use a zero growth model. So zero growth model, you just take the next dividend divided by the discount rate. We're not going to do that. There are probably some firms out there that we expect to grow at 0% for now and forever, maybe a Macy's or a JCPenney or something like that, although I think most people think those firms will eventually go out of business or get bought out by another firm. So we're going to use the constant growth, the Gordon growth model. Whether or not that long-term growth is ROE times retention, I'll be giving you these numbers so you don't have to worry about coming up with them. If you take the investment class, in my principles of investment class, we get into a little more detail on how I come up with that growth rate because you have to write a paper in that class where you value a company and you actually, actually do the discount rate and the growth rates. Um, most academia classes teach this formula. I just don't think it works all that well. And I can show you all kinds of data that it doesn't work all that well historically. <clears throat> um, but few few companies grow at one constant growth rate. But if Walmart grows four percent this year, and then six percent, and then three percent, and then negative five percent, and then positive fifteen percent, we'll probably be okay as long as it averages somewhere around our 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 forecast. So firms will go up and down all over the place. But what we're trying to do is get an average growth rate over all those years. Um, so. Whatever growth rate you apply, the value of stock is always the present value of those cash flows. So that doesn't change anything. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett said, investing is simple, but not easy. And I agree with that. It's simple, Warren Buffett, I can't spell Buffett. It's simple because Investing is all about discounted cash flows. That's all you got to do. You forecast the cash flows, you get the present value of them today. That is simple. What's not simple is coming up with the discount rate and coming up with that growth rate. That is not easy because we're having to go so far into the future. We're not very good at forecasting next year 
you know, you think about all the people in sitting in 2019 forecasting numbers for 2020, every one of those forecasts are way off now. No one was projecting oil prices would go below $10. Uh, I mean, I challenge you to find anybody who was forecasting oil prices to go below $10. There may have been some who said it was going to go back into the 20s. Um, or that Carnival Cruise and United Airlines would see 80, 90% drops in revenues. So, uh, you know, it's hard to forecast even just one year out because because so much stuff can happen. Um, so in the constant growth, here's our constant growth model. We just saw that one. Another model is the H model. I think I took the third, I can't remember if I, I might have taken the third model out. We'll see. I'll look at the Excel. Sometimes I include it, sometimes I don't. It's a model that I developed, and sometimes in this class I leave it out because I don't want you learning a model that's just purely mine that you wouldn't find in a normal textbook, and then in my investment class I bring it back in. So I do like the H model. The H model is a great model. What the H model allows you to do is have more than one growth rate. <clears throat> So the H model looks a lot like the dividend discount model, but it recognizes that a company may be going through an unusually high growth period. We might see this, especially in the next uh, couple of years, energy companies may be having incredibly high growth because you just have to imagine this is the low point um, and oil prices will probably increase from here. Who knows? But you think as bad as this year has been for energy companies that when they come out of it, their growth rates won't be five or six percent. They could be a hundred percent, three hundred percent because their earnings went almost to zero and now they're coming back. So the H model is a great model. I discovered the H model in the footnotes of a paper we had to read for the CFA exam. And I thought, well, this is a great model. I've used it ever since. There are other models out there that the formulas are far more complicated, but the H model's formula is fairly straightforward. You need a short-term growth rate. By the short-term growth rate, what we need is what we expect the stock to grow, or the earnings, I mean, the dividends to grow next year. And then we need a long-term sustainable growth rate that sometime in the future, this short-term growth rate is going to slowly decline over time until after some period of time, it's going to get to that long-term growth rate. How long is that period of time? Well, <clears throat> The H model assumes that that short-term growth rate will start at that rate the first year and will decay and decline year after year after year for two times H periods. So your H is the half-life of that short-term growth period. So if we think it's going to take 10 years to get from the short-term growth rate to long-term growth rate, then our H will be 5. If we think it's going to be 20 years, then our H will be 10. And one thing I'll say on the H, H is a really hard number to forecast. In my investment class and in my secure analysis class, students have a tough time coming up with that assumption. One thing I can help you with on that is some research that uh, some other professors have done. And firms that are growing really fast, it's extremely unusual for a firm to have extremely high growth rates for more than 10 years. Even if you look back at um, Intel, Microsoft, um, Amazon, Walmart, all the firms, Microsoft, you know, Microsoft had some incredibly growth rates during my career when, when they took over as the, the dominant uh, operating system. Those growth rates were just amazing and then it all stopped and they're having somewhat of a rebound now and coming back. But it's really hard for a trillion dollar company to grow 10, 15 percent. I think that's part of the struggle that Apple's having. Um, Alphabet, these firms that have been growing so fast that now they're trillion dollar, almost trillion dollar companies. It's just hard to grow a firm that fast. So, so I would just warn you that an H greater than five, which means 10 year of high growth is, is pretty unusual. Very few firms can actually sustain that. Now here's the formula. What I want to do with this formula is I want to take this part of it and just hide it. And if you look at it, we got dividend zero plus one plus growth divided by KE minus growth. That is a dividend discount model. So all we're doing with the H model is we're adding this inside section here. Very, very simple. It's dividend zero again, just like here, times that H times short-term growth minus long-term growth. Can't get much simpler than that. As sophisticated as the model is and as great of a job as it does, it uh, gives you a you know in a very simple formula it gives you a very sophisticated uh, analysis of your firm. <laughs> um, 
So you might say, okay, Google's growth rate next year is going to be 35 percent. I wouldn't probably go that high, but ultimately it's going to grow at 5 percent, which is what the economy is going to grow. It's going to take 20 years. So your short-term growth rate is 35 percent. Your H is 10 because 20 divided by 2. So that that could be your model. Now, unfortunately, Google doesn't pay dividends, so you'd have to use a different model. That's why sometimes I use my third model uh, because it doesn't require firm pay dividends. The firms I'm going to give you for the Excel applications, they all pay dividends. <clears throat> so I like the fact that this gradually moves the short-term growth rate down to the long-term growth rate. Um, for all stocks, I think the long-term growth rate should be some, somewhat close to what you think the U.S. economy, or at least the global economy, is going to grow. Um, the global economy or U.S. economy is probably going to grow anywhere in the four to four to six percent. I think makes sense. Um, GDP growth. I can't remember if we talked about this earlier, but it's going to be productivity growth plus labor growth plus expected. Where well, all of these are expected expected inflation. So if you look back historically, the U.S. productivity, and productivity is how much our economy grows minus how much our labor growth grows. So it's how much extra productivity gets. So if our economy grows 4%, but we only added 2% of labor, then our productivity is 2%. If our economy grows 4% and labor growth is 3%, then we only added 1% of productivity. If you look back historically at the U.S., our best decades of productivity growth were about 3%. Our average decades were about 2%. So 2% is not a bad number there. Labor growth, that has historically been 1% to 1.5%, but it's been 0 to negative the last few years because we have so many baby boomers retiring. So half a percent might make sense there. Expected inflation, who knows? With what the Fed's doing, some people think we might see hyperinflation. Some people think we might see what Japan has experienced, which is just another decade of very, very slow, low inflation. Um, but I think this is going to range in a reasonable assumption would be four to six percent. Productivity maybe two percent, labor growth maybe half a percent, expected inflation maybe two to three percent. You'll get numbers in the four to six percent range, which means your long-term growth for most companies, you remember with Walmart I used four and a half percent. I put them on the lower end of that range. But that should be a pretty decent growth rate for, for a company long term. Um, So um, I'll let you read some of these other paragraphs. It's just extra details on, on ways you can do to do the analysis. Uh, one of these is saying you can take the current stock price and try to back into the assumptions in the H model. So you're trying to figure out what the stock is worth, but instead what you can do is you can put the price of the stock here and try to figure out what assumptions give you that stock price, and then you can say, hey, that's what the market assumes. The problem with that approach is there's so many moving parts, you don't really know what the market expects on any of those. Um, so, but anyway, if you want, if you calculate that and you figure out that high growth is going to be two decades or more, the stock is probably overvalued because, as I said, it's very very difficult for firms to grow that fast for that long. Maybe a really small company, one that's just starting out, but even then, what we're noticing is a small company, especially tech companies, that's very successful. Instead of them becoming the next Microsoft. Instead, they get bought out about the time they become a $300, $400 million company. They get bought out, even a billion-dollar company. They get bought out by Apple or Amazon or Alphabet or uh, Alibaba, Alibaba, and they just never get to be that massive, massive firm. So it's getting tougher and tougher. But if your valuations, if this current stock price requires you to use a really high growth, short-term growth rate, and a really high age, that stock is probably overvalued. <laughs> Now, there are multi-stage growth models. I had to learn one of these in college. I would never ask you to learn one of those models. I had to actually memorize it for a final in one class, and I was amazed that the professor, I was actually the only student in the class who knew he was going to do that. I could just tell he was kind of upset at us. And so I, I'm the only one in class who actually memorized that formula. It's a massive formula. It's very difficult. Um, and the rest of the class just left that problem blank, and I was somewhat lucky on that, that question. Um, but multi-stage it's not necessary in the age of Excel uh, we can build all this in the computers and do whatever assumption we want to so you think think back to my Walmart example 
if I want to grow every year at a different growth rate, I can do that. And I can value out the value the company doing that. And it's it's you know it's very easy to do that in Excel. So I see no reason. If you have a class that requires you to memorize one of the multi-stage growth formulas, email me and maybe I can talk to the professor and get you out of that because I, I think it's a waste of time to memorize something like that. I don't know anyone in finance who actually has these formulas memorized anyway. They're just not worth it. I do think you should know if you're a finance major, I would know forever the H model. It's a really good model to have in your hip pocket. Uh, if a firm doesn't pay dividends, uh, there are ways to do that. Um, I have what I call a quantitative model in Excel. I'm going to put this on pause and show it to you. So this, I'll put this model out there. I'll save it the blackboard. It's not out there right now, but I'll save this model just in case someone wants to use it. So what this model does is it allows you to value a firm like Google that doesn't pay dividends. So Google's earnings per share right now are $49.16. I think long-term their growth rate is going to be 6%. I think it's at that higher end of economic growth. Remember I said 4 to 6%. I think right now they're growing at 20%. If you look at their recent financials, 20%. I'm sorry, 5G technology and autonomous vehicles and all kinds of things they're involved with. I, I think they're going to they have the ability to grow at the higher end of my range. But 20% now, and I think it'll take 20 years for them to go from a 20% growth rate to a 6% growth rate. Here's my discount rate for them, 9.2%. I use a 2% risk-free, 6% market risk premium. I use a beta of 1.2, doing exactly what you did on, on paper 7. Um, ultimate payout. What I mean here is when, so here's the way this model works. They're starting off with earnings of $49. Those earnings are going to start growing at 20%, but over the next 20 years, the earnings are going to grow at 6%. Once their earnings hits that long-term growth, once they start growing at 6%, they're going to start paying a dividend, and that dividend, dividend will be 40% of their earnings because 40% is a typical payout for a firm. So my argument is when Google is growing fast, they have great, investment opportunities um, they'll keep reinvesting in the firm they won't pay dividends but once they get to be a more stable long-term firm they'll only grow at six percent they'll start paying dividends and so that's what this does it takes their earnings per share and grows it starting at 20 percent and slowly bringing that 20 percent down year after year and then when their growth at six percent in 20 years they have really high earnings because their earnings are growing fast uh, that looks like a massive number, but over 20 years, it's not all that big. And so here's their dividends. And then I take the present value of those dividends. I discount them at 9.2%. And when I do that, I get a price of 1303.63. Google's currently trading for 1268.98, so right at 1270. So you look at that and you say, um, yeah, they look well valued right now. Obviously, you could change any of this assumptions, get radically different numbers, but you're in the ballpark of their valuation, 1300 versus 1270. Uh, so that's what I call a proprietary growth model. I'll um, let me put this down here. So this is not the price. This is my value that I'm putting on what I think they're worth, and this is the current price here. And so, yeah, we're just trying to decide what do we buy Google or buy Alphabet or not which what do we do so um, yeah so I'll save this and put it out on blackboard so you can you can see an example of of valuing a company that does not pay a dividend um, all right so what I want to do in the last session is get a little bit more into how to come up with the growth rate of your company um, <clears throat> I do do my other model down here real quickly, so I will talk through that one uh, next session as well. And we might be able to at least start the Excel application number 11 next next session. So, so we'll start here. This is really, really important. How do you come up with a long-term or short-term and long-term growth rate for a firm? Um, very, very difficult to do, and it's extremely important assumptions and studies in the past have shown that we finance people are actually not very good at doing that. So um, I'll try to give you some ideas to think about. If you take, especially my security analysis class, we spend a lot of time working through these, these types of uh, assessment, assessments. All right, thanks.